Hi everyone, um, welcome to the talk. It's good to see many familiar faces out. So welcome to Dis Existentialism. Um, I shouldn't have started off the slides with two lies, but um, I have not stopped worrying, nor do I love the spinal cord injury. But it was irresistible because I stole it from Dr. Strangelove. And uh, just for your information, the quote at the bottom is from a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a Lutheran priest uh, in Germany, um, took up the resistance against the Nazis, um, was involved in the plot to kill Hitler, unfortunately was caught and uh, executed. And I don't know if he's considered an existentialist. He didn't write much about the issue, I think. But his, um, his quote there, uh, not in the flight of thought, but in the act alone is their freedom, um, I think represents existentialist thought. And you'll see throughout the uh, You'll see throughout the um, lecture that it kind of meshes nicely with that. So to begin with, I'm just going to give a little background on my story for um, those who may not know. Um, I grew up on Long Island. I grew up there from like about the third grade or so and um, lived there until uh, my injury, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, there's me in front of uh, the Capitol building in Vermont, um, being bipedal. There's my uh, danger mobile. Um, I lived a life of danger, as you can see. And so one uh, night, one, one day when I was coming home from school, I was involved um, in a motorcycle accident a few blocks from my house. And um, I don't remember much. I have amnesia um, about the incident. But I subsequently fractured uh, my vertebrae in my neck. And that led to uh, resulting paralysis throughout my body from my shoulders on down or so. Um, so I wasn't thinking about it at the time, but that's a pretty significant disability. Um, it was disabling in that it was a physical impairment and it affected all aspects of my life, um, not just obvious things like walking or sensation and pain, but things that um, extended into the social realm and um, even beyond. So if we're going to talk about disability and existentialism, maybe we should just talk about disability for a minute. Um, many people in the room um, are looking at disability or have looked at disability through a certain perspective, the same type of perspective that I was looking at it before my injury, in that um, for a long time, disability was viewed as some sort of medical problem with the body or the mind, um, which needed to be uh, fixed or cured or treated, mainly by practitioners, um, surgeons or therapists, doctors, um, in an attempt to uh, normalize that, that person into society. Um, that seems reasonable in, in, um, you know, in some instances, uh, to make that person fit in better to society. But after the Cultural Revolution of the 60s, um, many people with disabilities and advocates uh, started questioning that model, the so-called medical model. Um, in response, they said, you know, the medical model unintentionally uh, may degrade and devalue people with disabilities. For example, by telling them that they're not quote unquote normal or that the condition they have needs to be treated. For example, someone born with a congenital uh, condition such as being deaf. You know, they might not want um, to be like, quote, everyone else. Um, so the emphasis switched from um, focusing on the person and what was, quote, unquote, wrong with them to focusing on society, uh, focusing on social aspects, accommodations, for example like universal design, making a building or uh, a workspace uh, accessible for all sorts of folks and their different needs and abilities. Um, social support, for example, for kids at school or um, for uh, different types of employees with whatever needs they needed. Um, it also differentiated between impairment versus disability, whereas they said impairment is what's physically different about you or 
uh, mentally different about you. Disability, however, was caused by the interaction between your um, condition and society. Whereas the medical model was the pendulum swinging in one direction, some say the social model was it swinging in the other direction. And so more recently, organizations like the WHO have developed the biopsychosocial model, which tries to get a more holistic picture, um, including things like, which it's an, uh, um, it's a, an umbrella term, disability, uh, for impairments, activity limitations, and participation restrictions. And so it refers to both the negative aspects of the impairment, I mean, of the interaction between the individual and their environment, as well as that individual's contextual factors. So, for example, their personal factors and the environment. And this little graph kind of illustrates it. So disability is a difficulty in any of these three areas of functioning. You have impairments in the body, alterations in body structure. You have activity limitations, so difficulty in executing certain activities. And then you have participation restrictions, problems with involvement in different areas of life, uh, maybe accessibility to uh, different activities. Here's a more recent model uh, by a disability advocate named Ricky Buchanan, who writes, so you have the medical model, the social model, and the integrated model. And these are all theoretical kind of lenses through, um, you, through which you can look at disability. Um, so whereas the medical model said the disability resides in the individual, and the social model said, no, it's really the interaction between the individual and society, a more integrated model says it may be mostly the integration, but there's some negative aspects of the disability inside the individual that they may want to focus on. Uh, similarly, whereas the medical model uh, specifically pointed that the disability, that the disability is negative. Um, the social model said, no, it's neutral. An integrated model says, well, being disabled is neutral, right? You can add whatever value you want to it. Um, but certain attributes may be looked at um, as negative, for example, pain or fatigue or depression. But the distinction can only be made by those living with the disabilities. And so that choice is um, important to an existential uh, viewpoint on it, which I'll cover in a little bit. In a little bit. So for I'll just go through this real quick because it's a personal story about how I was coping for a while. Um, at first, after my injury, you know, I relied on family and friends, um, nurses and doctors and people who were there along the way, um, and focusing on long-term goals like getting back into school or employment or hanging out again kept me going, um, as well as kind of a neglect of some of the unpleasant parts of spinal cord injury, as well as uh, downward comparison kept me going. So downward comparison is uh, essentially a way of looking at those who may be worse off than you or in situations that are less desirable and saying or and thinking, you know, it's I'm thankful that I don't have it that bad. And on the one hand, um, you know, I was looking at the, the world, and we're a very small portion of it. Um, there's a billion people with disabilities around the world, and most of them live in the developing world. And I was still pretty privileged, and I had first world care. Um, and I was involved with a lot of social justice campaigns. So it was easy to ignore um, the things that were wrong with my life. Um, and it did provide a perspective on where I sat in you know, the grand scale of things. But it also avoided my problems. Um, it put things on you know, the back burner. And uh, they shouldn't stay there for too long, because you do neglect um, what is important. And uh, so then that, that all came to an end uh, pretty abruptly. Um, so spinal cord injury is not all fun and games. Um, I know I make this look easy, and you're like, <laughs> I want to be that guy, but uh, no, no, there's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And um, so um, after a, uh, an end of a relationship that was kind of triggered by uh, disability issues, 
I, I had a, a crisis moment, an existential crisis, if you will, which I call my quad life crisis. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, led to, uh, it led to a lot of just throughout the day. Um, you know, the old coping mechanisms of downward comparison and whatnot really weren't effective anymore, you know. I started thinking, no, I'd really like to have my independence again. And there were just the constant reminders of the disability from the minute I woke up, um, you know, the fact that I couldn't get out of bed myself to um, the fact that I needed uh, extra caregivers for essentially the, the most intimate parts of my day um, to, you know, being in class and seeing people twirl their um, pen between their fingers and then looking down and, you know, being reminded of that. Um, so it felt like I was in prison, you know. Um, it wasn't a real prison. It was, um, you know, in my head, essentially. But it felt like this was going to be a continual um, struggle. And I really started questioning why and uh, how I would uh, go on. So then I started uh, reading more about existentialism. Um, I'd been introduced to it in high school, in, um, in towards the last few years of my um, undergrad education at the UW. Um, but I started reading more into it. Um, so most of you who thought about the talk maybe, um, if you're not familiar with it, maybe thinking, you know, what is existentialism? And this little video, it's only like 30 seconds, and you're going to have to really pay attention because it's quick, um, offers a little intro in it. If you can explain it, I'd be delighted. Well, it's perfectly obvious. Man, in contrast to other animals, is conscious of his own existence. Therefore, conscious of the possibility of non-existence. Ergo, he has anxiety, right? Oh, right, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Well, it's wicked. <laughs> so I found that, I think that was a 60s movie. And um, so essentially, it's existentialism or existential thought is a wide range of um, philosophical thought uh, dating back a few hundred years that looks at the different questions and the different aspects of life that considering that consider uh, things like what does it mean to be a human being, be conscious of your own existence, uh, be conscious of um, things like death and uh, other great uh, aspects of life that have meaning which other animals and um, other things in the world do not have, as far as we can tell. Um, there's a lot to say about that, and I'll get into it in a minute, but if I were to summarize it in one sentence, I would say, um, because there is this uh, void of purpose or uh, inherent meaning, uh, one must create their own meaning through the way they live in spite of the struggles um, that they'll face. So. I'm just going to give an introduction into uh, three authors at first. Um, Jean-Paul Sartre was probably uh, the, one of the most famous existentialists. He, he liked being called an existentialist and uh, the term existentialism. Just a few things to note about him. He wrote in a book called Existentialism is Humanism, probably his most accessible um, writing, which is just a lecture uh, you could probably uh, read it online. He wrote in it a, a quote that said, existence uh, precedes essence. And that summarizes a lot of existential thought, which um, Sartre, as a, an atheist existentialist, um, in opposition to others like Kierkegaard, who were Christians, um, wrote that, no, unlike a chair or a desk, which has some purpose uh, because an artisan uh, made it, humans are just the result of evolution. And so we don't have inherent meaning that comes with the package. So your existence, we, um, as he says, your existence depends on, rather your essence depends on what you make of yourself. Uh, so that's the first principle of existentialism. Um, man first exists, he encounters himself, that is, he becomes uh, conscious and um, starts to look at what he's doing, and then defines himself afterwards. Um, and that he, and it, you'll have to um, excuse the gendered references, but most of these writers wrote like that, um, in, including de Beauvoir. 
Uh, man simply is. So in that sense, it's neutral, like the integrated model showed. Um, and he's not just what he thinks he is, but he is what he wills, meaning he is how he acts um, through his choices. He also wrote that man is condemned to be free. Um, by that, he meant he's responsible for everything he does, even in times of angst and despair, um, uncertainty and anguish. It's, it's tempting to look at existential writing these days without some of the darker themes that surrounded these authors. Uh, Sartre and Camus, for example, were both French and living during World War II. They were part of the anti-Nazi resistance. So they, they weren't doing this on vacation. You know, they, they had lots of deep issues, and they felt um, lost at many times in anguish, as they, as they say. Um, you know, as he says, we're left alone without an excuse. And so this condemnation to freedom uh, is not really a recipe for j uh, joy or um, you know, happiness, but rather a life where you're um, aware of your decisions and um, you reflect on them. Um, and this type of freedom that existentialists talk about um, is intensified and complicated by disability, um, as one writer says, because it's easier to reject one's freedom when you've had all of these limitations placed on you. Another writer, Camus, wrote in an essay called The Myth of Sisyphus, who describes Sisyphus. So Sisyphus was a Greek character who was condemned by the gods to push a boulder up um, a hill for eternity, only to have the boulder, when it gets to the top, roll back down to the other side. So it was this really futile work, uh, repetitive and uh, absurd. And Camus talked about the absurdity of life uh, extensively. But what he said was, when he read about um, Sisyphus, was that his so-called torture would also be at the same time as victory. So it was a radical departure from how uh, many had viewed him before. Um, one writer says, Sisyphus takes pride in his daily accomplishments of getting that boulder up. You know, he looks at it with courage and uh, determination, and he deals with that, um, with that adversity as a test, um, as a way to choose how to act in the face of hardship. We can thrive rather than go under when fate tests us and everything seems lost or impossible, as one author uh, sums up uh, Camus' writings. And Camus uh, finishes the end of his essay, itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happened. And then third, um, Simone de Beauvoir, who uh, was an American and wrote, I mean, who wrote about a variety of things, but was one of the first people who wrote extensively about the, um, the inequality of the sexes. And so she wrote in a book called The Second Sex, um, where she analyzed two different types of activities. Um, transcendent activities, which were creating or inventing, uh, surpassing, uh, moving towards the future, which uh, pushed you forward past your, where you were. And imminent activities, which were maintaining the status quo, sustaining or repairing. Um, things like cleaning the toilet. You know, um, she looked at the division of labor in the household and found that women were overwhelmingly relegated to imminent activities. And this is important both in that uh, feminist discourse, but also, I think, uh, for people with disabilities, because um, it seems that oftentimes people with disabilities are stuck in more imminent activities. For example, maintaining your health or adapting to society or navigating obstacles. And so with more time being spent on activities of imminence, uh, less is really available for transcendence. And so just keep in mind some of the activities that you do during the day, whether you have a disability or not, um, and try to differentiate whether um, it, they allow you to transcend or they're more imminent. Um, so just an example, my morning uh, and nightly imminent routines, which are uh, you know, at the top of my head. So, like I don't, I don't just roll out of bed like this. 
right? This all takes hard work. It's like a couple hours. I have to hire outside help, um, specialists. And so that I can't get away from. And that's certainly imminent. Um, and that just comes with the disability. Um, it's not really allowing me to um, move forward, but rather just maintaining uh, my health. And a fourth author I think we, should, uh, we could spend the whole talk on is a man named Viktor Frankl. He was a, um, an Austrian psychiatrist. Um, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And all of the books are up there if you're, um, if you're interested. Um, he was sent to a variety of concentration camps where his family, um, his wife, and uh, other relatives uh, all perished. And um, in it, he wrote of his experiences, especially of the people who inspired him or he was in awe of. Um, for example, he wrote, there were some who would go from hut to hut, giving away their last piece of bread, um, comforting others, um, which was a testament to show that everything can be taken from a person but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And he continues and says, um, you know, we in the camp noticed that every day, every hour offered the opportunity to make a decision which determined whether you would or not uh, or would not submit to the powers that threatened to rob you of your freedom, um, which determined whether or not you'd become the plaything of circumstance. Um, so it was, it may be a, quite a radical idea to um, look at this freedom that he insists on is available to all of us despite the most extreme circumstances. Um, and he argues that Although one can't be free of the biological, physical, and social factors around us, the person's always free to take a stand on these forces. And during the discussion time, you know, I'd like to ask people what they think about that. Is, is that always true? Are you always free? Um, what if some of the biological factors um, constrain your freedom? So save that for um, discussion. And he also talked about an, another thought which goes through existential writing. And that's what he called the tragic triad of pain, guilt, and death. These three things come up over and over again, especially in his practice as a psychotherapist. Um, and they all remind us of our suffering, our fallibility, and our mortality. And most existential writers uh, agree that these three things come with the price of being a human. Um, which is not a lesson you normally hear, or uh, not a tale you're normally told about life. Um, logotherapy was uh, the title of his um, practice or his method. And so he interviews, he quotes a guy named Jerry Long. And uh, so I just wanted to show you a little video of him. Jerry um, had a cervical level spinal cord injury too, and this is just uh, a minute of him talking. I know, Dr. Frankel, that you have written that there are three ways to find meaning, one being in adopting an attitude toward a fate which cannot be changed. And in Jerry's case, uh, it seems to me that that's what logotherapy has done for you. You have a permanent uh, disability, a severe disability, there's nothing much you can do about that, but what you do have control over is your attitude. Could you tell us how logotherapy helped to shape your attitude? I think that it's important to remember my attitude adoption and the logotherapy that I employed initially was without any knowledge of logotherapy. I had not read any books and I had no acquaintance with it, but intuitively I modified my attitude toward the situation in one particular line that, that Dr. Frankel quotes fairly often, I broke my neck, it didn't break me. I had a physical constraint that I had to deal with over which I could not change. I had no ability to suddenly walk again. However, I did have the ability to choose to live and at least attempt a meaningful life in spite of that physical disability. And so Frankel goes on in his uh, article, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, 
And he writes about his experiences of people asking him, you know, for example, what is the meaning of life? Then you talk about meaning. And he says, you know, that's kind of like asking a chess master, what's the best move? In essence, it's different. It's different for everyone. Um, and it's different at all parts of your life throughout the different moments of your life. And so finding out that meaning is up to you. That, that's, in essence, uh, a core principle of existentialism, that without this inherent meaning in life, it's up to you um, based on how you live and uh, the decisions you make and the values you hold uh, to, to impart your own meaning. Um, on finding meaning, he says there's three ways to do this, according to him. One is in the creative work we do and the deeds that we do. So creative, those transcendent activities. Um, two is experiencing the values that we hold to. For example, love or justice or other things that we uh, find meaningful in life and seeking actions that uh, fulfill those. Um, and three is the stand that we take towards a fate we cannot control. And so this is his finding meaning in suffering. Um, everyone has unpleasant uh, aspects of their life, um, pain, mental or uh, physical, you know, even without disabilities. And so I think to me it's kind of liberating to frame it in this, uh, in this way. And he also adds that significant meaning in life comes from serving a, a greater purpose than oneself. And I'll talk about this, uh, maybe the more descriptive side of this, in a minute toward the end regarding how uh, neuroscience has shown that this is actually um, a more stimulating way for your, your brain to work. <laughs> he also writes that if you seek pleasure and happiness as your end goal, you'll, you'll most likely miss, um, you'll often miss. But if they, um, if they are uh, resulting from your end goals, your, your goals that have some meaning for you, um, they, um, that's a better way to go about. Um, throughout my reading about um, disability and existentialism, I found um, a few paradoxes. And David Barnard, who wrote a, um, a book called, or a chapter called Chronic Illness and the Dynamics of Hoping, writes about an existential paradox of chronic and disability, chronic illness and disability. And then it's, he says, people with disabilities are pulled between a self-protective withdrawal or eager participation in uh, the normal world. So for example, it would be great not to be reminded of all the things I can't do and just stay home. But really, that would, that would kind of suck. Um, and so I'd want to get back into the, the things that I used to do and new things that I've discovered. But there's you know, a pull. And in the same way, they're impelled to defy limitations that they've either been placed on them um, through some biological constraint or physical constraint or social constraint. But at the same time, you need to accept those, some of those limitations in order not to go crazy, right? You, like, I'm not going to go running again. Um, and so you need to accept or reject. And that paradox, um, he writes, is illustrated when you start looking at how much of your disabled, disabled body or aspect you want to accept or uh, ignore. You know, you accept too much. Um, you start to identify with your impaired aspect, and that's detrimental. But at the same time, if you ignore it completely, that's going to lead to problems. Um, the same thing goes for accepting or rejecting um, denigration or rejection from your, your society or your environment. Um, it's easy to um, accept internalizations of how you're perceived in, uh, in, within your peers. But at the same time, rejecting that totally may um, push things you know, into the back burner again. And this, this boundary of uh, what one writer called finitude and transcendence, that is, the things that you face every day versus the things you want to be and the things um, you aim for, um, is not just a problem for people with disabilities, it's a human problem. 
um, and it comes up over and over again. So there's uh, some contemporary views on existentialism and disabilities. Um, I think a man named Aaron Mark sums up an existential thought um, in this and relates it to disability. For example, he says, you know, we live in a random, chaotic world um, without inherent meaning. Uh, so unjust things happen all the time, unfair things to the people we love. Um, these things do happen. Um, but the freedom of choice is the central principle behind existential thinking. Um, so meaning is imparted subjectively by the individual. And so he argues that the person has a freedom to choose the meaning of their disability. And so this may be, this is a good question for discussion too. I mean, is that true all the time? If there's social constraints or um, oppression from different sources, do you still have the freedom to choose the meaning of your disability? Um, we should look at that. Um, he proposes, or he writes about a tripartite model that is existence, essence, and the ideal. So your body, which is your existence, um, doesn't necessarily mean your essence, your, your mind, um, what meanings you attach to your, to your life. And neither of them constitute um, the person you'd like to be. So differentiating this is a way um, to look at your existence a little bit different. And a person can learn to view themselves and their disability less harshly and not reject their disabled parts. And so this, well, after I read this, I was like, oh yeah, I guess I don't have to hate that, you know, my legs are painful and don't move anymore. Um, but just having that option open seems, um, seems helpful to me. And so this kind of coalesces with uh, Ricky's model from before. And so the existential ap approach would emphasize the importance of the choices one faces now um, and in the future, including the choice of the significance they put on their disability or the significance they place on their past. Maybe it led to their disability. Things like the tragic triad might come up again. Guilt, for example. Um, and Sarah Gehring, a professor in uh, disability studies at the UW, after she looked at my slides, reminded me of uh, disability justice, which um, is you know, the main theme behind this group. Um, whereas existential writers mostly talked about the individual and how they should act subjectively, it's also important to mention that Sartre can, um, considered the social situation as important. For example, he writes, man is defined first of all as being in the situation which means he forms a synthetic whole with the situation. So that means biological, economic, political, <coughs> cultural. He can't be distinguished from a situation because it forms him and decides his possibilities. And it also decides his limitations um, within which he um, may have freedom to act. So this condition, um, which is a combination of limitations that are both objective, right, because we recognize them, but also subjective because we live them. And without people living them, without people doing them, um, they wouldn't be there. And so one writer sums up Sartre's views and he says, you know, the highest value I would, uh, I would place is that of generosity. I could enhance the, other, the overall situation for myself and others by keeping the other's freedom open through my work. And I don't do this because I'm obliged to, uh, but beca because it makes sense and it creates the best possible space and atmosphere for my existence. Um, lastly, it says, she says, it's no longer sufficient to be either interested in the individual progress or political action. One has to combine the two. Um, bad faith is something that comes up in existentialism a lot and essentially means uh, self-deceiving yourself. I mean, self-deception, uh, avoiding to have, avoiding um, making a decision or choosing. Courage is another uh, existential theme to assert that one should live courageously 
in spite of the inevitability of death um, and the unpredictable nature of life. And this requires a willingness to make commitments, uh, attempt to influence outcomes by control and learn from failures and successes by facing challenges. And authenticity you'll see over and over again. Authenticity implies that you should live according to one's values, your motivations and intentions, despite the hardships, despite the physical or mental disability, or the limitations that um, they impose. And it's emphasis on um, taking responsibility for one's attitude, despite the circumstances that they may find themselves in. Um, it demands that we face the situations we are in. Um, and Sartre acknowledged that this, dis this uh, demands much courage, and uh, more, than, more than courage. It uh, demands being conscious of your situation every day. And so he, he thought that it was actually found uh, pretty rarely. Um, and lastly, um, for the science nerds out there, um, I just wanted to add a little descriptive info. Um, <coughs> the intersection of uh, philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience um, shows that meaning in life, and I think they studied uh, several dozen people who had spinal cord injuries, um, has been shown to be negatively associated with symptoms like depression and uh, positively associated with psychological well-being. Um, that significance is also determined um, by your goals, the goals that you place in your life. And so just one difference is uh, narrow versus open-ended goals. So a narrow <coughs> goal would be, for example, making money, right? Um, a person who has that goal has less processing because there's not going to be a ton of things throughout the day that are going to uh, trigger that in his brain or her brain. Um, more throughout his, his day is forgotten or ignored. And there's less meaning in the range of uh, relevant experiences um, that they experience during the day. On the other hand, if you had a goal like discovering life's meaning, um, every moment that you face, every encounter, um, every person you meet um, can become meaningful. And um, the domain of important experiences that you experience throughout your day, even the, the hardships and whatnot, um, expands. And lastly, um, humor is, uh, is undervalued, um, I think, when you're looking at disability. And so, just a quote by Frankel, who talks about the jokes, even in the concentration camps. And he said, humor was another of the soul's weapon in the fight for self-preservation, because it offers the ability to rise above any situation, even if it only lasted for a little bit. John Callahan, for those who don't know, was a, an icon in the, um, in the spinal cord injury community, as well as the overall um, disabled population. Mother Jones, he, he was injured, uh, I think, in his late teens or um, early, early 20s or so in a car accident. And uh, he couldn't move his hands very well. But he held a pen together and became quite a prolific cartoonist. I think Robert Will, uh, Robin Williams actually wrote um, the introduction to one of his books. And uh, he um, even had a, a video, um, a documentary made by him. I think it's called Touch Me Somewhere Where I Can Feel. Um, <laughs> Mother Jones described him as a quadriplegic recovering alcoholic, ex-Catholic orphan cartoonist who, who recounts the lighter side and being paralyzed for life. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of his, a few of his cartoons. Um, here you see, I don't know if you could see it, but there's a broken down wheelchair in the middle of the desert. And uh, the title on the bottom says, don't worry, he won't get far on foot. That was also the, uh, the title of his uh, autobiography. And then uh, the second one is an example of social comparison. Um, there's two heads. On, a, on little rollers. The head on the left has an eye patch. And the guy on the right says, people like you are a real inspiration to me. <laughs> and then the third one's just a nice social commentary. 
if you notice the number of legs each person has. Um, the dude in the, the chair only has two legs. It's kind of weird. Um, and then lastly, I know all this philosophy might have been a bit deep for people um, who aren't you know, accustomed to reading about this kind of nonsense. Um, but uh, sometimes you just have to tell yourself um, you know, certain affirmations throughout your, um, you know, throughout your life. And so I, I want to turn to another philosopher um, that I follow once in a while, um, you know, when I need that daily inspiration. I deserve good thing. I am entitled to my share of happiness. I refuse to beat myself up. I am an attractive person. I am fun to be with. Daily Affirmation with Stuart Smalley. Stuart Smalley is a caring nurturer, a member of several 12-step programs, but not a licensed therapist. I'm going to do a terrific show today, and I'm going to help people because I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Yeah, thank you.